Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again today, some nine weeks, I think it is, into lockdown. Now, I suspect some of you are struggling today with all the coronavirus issues and the isolation. Some of you may be finding it a bit of a challenge having returned to work this week. And some of you key workers have been working throughout in very difficult and challenging circumstances. Well, this morning, relax. Join us on a journey of praise and worship and prayer and teaching from the Word of God. We hope you will be uplifted, challenged, but most of all, encouraged as we face these difficult days together. And know this, you are not alone. Now we have a wonderful guest speaker with us this morning. Dan Hubbard is an assistant pastor at Oak Hall Church in Caterham, Surrey. And thanks to the wonders of the internet, he's been able to travel all this way to join us virtually at no cost at all. We're delighted to have him with us. And Dan is actually the grandson of John and Ruth Bates. John, an elder statesman in our church. So it's a double delight and a privilege to have Dan here with us. And we look forward to hearing from him shortly. And we'll be focusing this morning on the words of the prophet Habakkuk, who lived in difficult times, but he learned how to trust God. He said this, Lord, I have heard the news about you. I am amazed at what you have done. Lord, do great things once again in our time. Make those things happen again in our own days. Now, is that not a prayer that we're all echoing today in these challenging times? So enjoy the service and I'll be back a little later.
something a little bit different but I want you to pay special attention because there are three little words that all of us at some point during our lives whether we were children whether we were teenagers whether we were adults would have used these three particular words but I'm going to stop that there now I'm going to hand straight over to my team that I've put on a mission today I want you to watch and I'll get back to you after you've seen the video clip. Boys, you've been sent this letter by Sam and it says, Hi boys, your mission, should you decide to take it on, is for each of you to wash the dishes at home this week. You will be rewarded if you successfully complete the mission. successfully completed your mission today. Here are your rewards off Sam. Jamie? Thank you Sam. Daniel? Thanks Sam. Josh? That's not fair. I done most of the dishes and then Jamie only done two and Dan's only done like four. Well, did you get the three words? It's not fair. That's what Josh said when he'd finished doing the dishes. The other two had done the dishes, but not as many, and he felt it wasn't fair. But they all got the same reward, the chocolate. And it's the same for you and I. When Jesus went to the cross, he could have said, it's not fair, but he didn't. And we end up with the reward, the reward being a home in heaven. And that's the message this morning. We don't deserve it, but we have it because of what he did on the cross for you and for me. Amen. Morning, everyone. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago, Sam set the children a challenge to draw a picture or make a model of their ideas of church. And I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the entry, well, the entries we got for that. Uh, first of all, we've got Josh's uh, entry made with Magnetico bricks uh, stuck together. And what I really like about this one is that it's the church is open and see-through. It's transparent. There's nothing hidden. 
I like this person sitting outside. I'm not sure whether that's one of the church people coming out uh, to share Jesus with the world or somebody wanting to come in and join the church. This picture's from Naomi and Naomi's idea of church is that it's full of lots of people with smiling faces and isn't that a lovely picture of church? And then finally we have a joint effort from Josh and Dan. Now I love all the different forms of transport that people have used to get to church and I notice that the people sitting in church are socially distancing as appropriate but what Josh and Dan wanted to point out, the essential features of church are the coffee station and the baptistry. So well done everyone who took part in those and Sam will be in touch with you with a reward for that. Thank you for taking part. Bye. Good morning church. It's my privilege to pray with you this morning. During this time I've been studying Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray. Pete talks about four things in that book. He talks about us pausing, rejoicing, asking and yielding. So let's just take a moment to pause. And whilst I've been meeting with my colleagues each day for our lunchtime prayer meeting, one of the things that we have been doing regularly to rejoice is to read from the Psalms. This is Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purpose of it, purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. Heavenly Father, we are amazed by you. We are amazed that you can gather the sea into jars. And Father, this morning as we come to you, we remember particularly, Father, those people who are really struggling with anxiety, with worry, depression, even some who are considering suicide. And Father, we just pray that you would put your healing hand upon them that they would know your presence very close to them at this time. Father, we pray for those who are ill in our hospitals and care homes and in their own homes with COVID-19. Father, again, we pray that you would put your healing hand upon them. And Father, we know that as we consider this time, that some people are going to be suffering for a long time after this pandemic has cleared. Some have lost jobs, some have had family breakdowns. Father, we pray for them too. And we pray again, Father, that you would come by your spirit, that you would heal, that you would find new employment for these people. And Father, as we yield to you, I'm reminded by the words in Zephaniah, the Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The Lord your God is with you. Amen. The reading today comes from the book of Habakkuk, 
He was a prophet, and this was written about 600 years before the time of Christ. And at the time in the land of Judah, sin was rampant. And the, the people worshipped idols. They were even sacrificing their children to pagan gods. So it was an awful time and there was a lot of injustice. I'm going to read from uh, the final three verses of this short book. Chapter 3 and verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. forever in the heavens sovereign king of earth and space you give life to those who seek you through your faithful love and grace Sometimes it's hard to trace When my way is hid in darkness Who oh, I will live by faith Though the fruit trees do not blossom And no grapes be on the vine Though the fields should all be empty And the land be bare
And though the fruit trees do not blossom And no grapes be on the vine Though the field should all be empty And the land be bare and dry Though no meat should grace my table I will find my joy in this God will be my strength He will save and keep Come on Though the fruit trees do not blossom And no grapes be on the vine Though the fields should all Well, good morning, Chaldine. And can I start by saying uh, what a privilege it is to be able to share this morning with you. You know, I can remember growing up and coming on visits to the northeast to see my grandparents and coming along to Chaldine. It was always a real joy to be there and to see you all. And so it's a real privilege uh, this morning to be able to share with you uh, this morning, although be it virtually in these times. Well, You might be familiar with the story of the Titanic. You might be more familiar maybe with how the story ends to the Titanic. It hits an iceberg, some incredibly emotional music then plays, and then, well, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. But, you know, the great irony of the Titanic is that as it was being built, people across the country were heralding the Titanic as the best boat that had ever been built. Some were even saying about the Titanic that it was unsinkable, it was too powerful, it was so robust, it was using all the modern technologies of the time. And yet, upon examining the Titanic and its design, they found that actually, despite it being heralded as unsinkable, it actually had a fatal flaw. And that was at the bottom of the Titanic, Uh, It was made up of 15 different compartments Uh, and the walls on the outside of those compartments, well, well, they were fine. They they were robust and watertight, but the walls that divided each of the compartments, well, they weren't. uh, They weren't robust enough and it turns out that they didn't go high enough above water level. And so if water got into one compartment, well, it would get into all 15 compartments. And so the once unsinkable ship, well, when crisis hit, when the iceberg hit, well, it had had its foundations completely exposed. And do you know, like the people who boarded the Titanic over a hundred years ago, do you know, we often put our confidence and our trust in things around that often seem unsinkable. You know, they become our foundations in life. It's things to use another boat term. They become our anchor that we hope will sustain us and and hold us in turbulent and tough times in life. And yet, especially in the times that we're living in at the moment, when crisis comes, when the iceberg hits, when pandemic and, and lockdown come, do you know, often our supposed unsinkable and certain foundations in life are exposed and they come crashing down all around us. You know, maybe it might be that we anchor ourselves on on knowledge and understanding on and on knowing things that will see us through. And yet in something like we're going through at the moment, even the best minds of our country have to admit that there's stuff we don't know. And we don't know what ultimately might be the best decision to make. It might be that we anchor ourselves this morning on our resources, on on our money, on on our investments that we make. And yet at this time, we're going to go through another really hard uh, time of economic uncertainty. Uh, Businesses wondering whether they will survive, jobs, whether they will be kept, and whether once good investments that we made, whether, well, they're still good investments now. 
It might be that we anchor ourselves on relationships. You know, we build our lives around seeing and spending time with friends and family, being in their company. And yet what happens when all of that's taken away? You know, when we're forced to to be in isolation, to socially distance from one another, when we can't enjoy fellowship with one another, what happens when it's all taken away, the anchor that we thought would hold us? Do you know, these are all things, aren't they, that might look like robust and solid foundations. And yet none of them can be completely certain. In fact, one of the things that has been so stark about this crisis, hasn't it, is it's just highlighted how much we're not in control of our own lives, how much, how fragile our lives are, how the foundations that I often build my life around are actually not as firm as I once thought, just like the Titanic. But, you know, this morning I want to introduce us to the book of Habakkuk, because what's incredible about this book is that we're introduced to someone who, on the face of things, is going through the toughest, the most grueling and the bleakest of times. And yet this book of Habakkuk, it ends with him singing and rejoicing in the midst of the crisis that he's experiencing. In fact, what Habakkuk is going to show us this morning is that there is a foundation. There is an anchor in life that doesn't crumble in a crisis, that doesn't get exposed, that doesn't weaken even when the heaviest weights are put upon it. But, you know, I appreciate this morning that Habakkuk, well, it isn't one of those books that we often rush uh, to open in our Bibles. And just to set a bit of the context of where we're looking this morning, the book of Habakkuk, you see, whilst the book ends with Habakkuk, the character, singing, rejoicing, that's not actually how the book starts. At the start, we're introduced to Habakkuk and he's actually crying out to God. He's asking the big questions of God. In chapter one, verse two, Habakkuk says, how long, Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen. At the start of Habakkuk, he's looking around him and it's at a time where God's people had wandered so far away from the Lord, from trusting him and worshipping him. In fact, at this time, people were worshipping other gods from other nations around them. And Habakkuk, he's looking around him and he sees his town and people committing such violent acts towards one another. He sees injustice everywhere he looks and he and he's looking around and he's asking God the big questions. Where are you? What are you going to do, God? Don't you see what's happening? How long must this go on for? What are you going to do about it? And well, God graciously answers Habakkuk's prayer and he tells him that he is going to do something. In fact, he's going to send the nation of Babylon, the Babylonians, to come and actually take God's people into exile, in judgment. He's going to take them out of the land and take them away. Um, God is going to act. God is going to deal with what Habakkuk is crying out about. And then Habakkuk hears what God is going to do. And then he cries out again in the book. And we see that he says, well, Lord, why are you going to do that? How could you use the Babylonians? He's kind of saying, you know, don't you know how destructive and how how wicked they are? How could you, God, use them? He's crying out again. And yet in the book of Habakkuk, God again answers Habakkuk. And he says that, well, he doesn't not see what the Babylonians are doing and, and they won't be allowed to continue forever. And God will deal with them one day. But actually, God, in that response to Habakkuk, he tells Habakkuk how he's to live. God tells him how he's to live in the present. In fact, that's in chapter two, verse four, where God says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Or you could say the righteous person will live by his faith. In other words, God calls Habakkuk, despite everything that he sees, to trust in God's promises, to trust in his word and to let that be his foundation as he goes through life. To trust that God knows, to trust that God sees, he cares and he will act in the future. 
And so what the last chapter of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter three, which is where we're looking this morning, what this chapter is, is really showing us what it looks like to be someone who lives by faith as Habakkuk is called to live. You see, Habakkuk in this book is wonderful. He goes on a journey from why to worship, from asking the big questions to ending up praising God in the midst of his circumstances. And, you know, he's not praising God, as we see, because suddenly God has sorted everything out for him. In fact, it's quite the opposite. In chapter three, verse 17, at the start of our passage, Habakkuk describes what he's going through. He says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. I mean, this is a desperate situation Habakkuk is facing and he describes here. I mean, some of us might not be too bothered if there weren't any olives uh, for us to eat. That wouldn't bother us in the slightest. Maybe we quite enjoy that. But it's going way further than there just not being any olives to eat. Habakkuk is saying that there's no food anywhere. There's no cattle to eat, no sheep in the pens. And if you're in those times, like those people were, if you're heavily dependent upon farming and agriculture, well, this is as big a crisis as you can imagine, a crisis like we're experiencing at the moment. And this morning, well, we're going to see how Habakkuk responds to the circumstances that he's facing. And I've just got one simple point for us this morning, and that is though X, though X, X standing for whatever we're facing, whatever our present circumstances, though X, yet I, though X, yet I. Because this really is the big turning point in our passage. It's the big turning point in the whole book of Habakkuk, because Habakkuk, he stops telling us what's going on around him. He stops describing his present circumstances. He stops describing the different sufferings that he is going through. And he starts to say, yet I. And those two words change everything. In other words, what he's doing is he's saying, in spite of everything going on around, in spite of the circumstances that I face, I'm going to respond in a different way. I'm going to respond in a way that, that people wouldn't expect me to respond. He says in verse 18, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my saviour. And when you read those words, aren't they amazing? Aren't they incredible considering everything that Habakkuk is going through? I just want to say at this point that, well, please don't think that this is telling Christians to have some weird response to tough times or to going through tough times. Uh, this isn't saying that Christians have to be those who are always rejoicing and singing like everything is great when actually it's not. Uh, that almost we, we sort of don't, we, we pretend that everything's okay uh, when it's not. No, Habakkuk himself, doesn't he? In his book, he shows us in his book that there are times where we're crying out to God. We're crying out why God. We're crying out where God. In the Psalms, in the Bible, so many of them, aren't they? They're, they're describing the grief and the sorrow and the pain that people are going through as people cry out to God in the midst of their circumstances and showing how there's a right response to suffering. But, you know, what this part of Habakkuk is giving us is it's giving us a perspective. It's giving us a foundation and a hope to carry us through the tough times, these times of suffering. You see, in Habakkuk's response, he shows us that actually his present circumstances don't dictate, they don't change the certainty of God's promises to him. They don't change the certainty of God's word to him. Whilst everything in his world at that moment must have been screaming out that God wasn't there, that God wasn't working, that God wasn't going to fulfill his promises. Habakkuk doesn't let that dictate or change his confidence in the Lord is God. And he's rejoicing in the Lord, isn't he? That's why he's rejoicing. I will rejoice in the Lord, God, my saviour. 
it doesn't change that reality one bit. And, you know, everything this morning for us, you know, might be looking the same. It might look like everything's pointing one way. It's pointing away from the truth that God is working. It's pointing away from the fact that God is fulfilling his promises. But, you know, let Habakkuk be a real encouragement to us this morning. That whilst our present circumstances, our present experience might look one way, actually that's not the reality. And God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his word and he wants that to be our foundation in our lives. You know, it might look this morning that, you know, we're facing uncertainty about our future. and We don't know what life, what work will maybe look like in the future after all of this passes. But though we face uncertainty, yet I can rejoice in the Lord because I know his promises to me. I know that he says that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. He's begun that good work in us and he will be faithful to his promise that his work that he started through me and in me, he will complete It might look at this this morning that the church is uh, dispersed and isolated. It looks, though, that the church is weak. Well, actually, it looks like the church is weak from reaching out to the community, from those around us. Uh, But though it looks like the church is weak, yet I will rejoice because I know the promises of God and that he uh, that nothing can stop his church from growing, you know, one secular newspaper was reporting uh, earlier on that apparently one in three 18 to 30 year olds have tuned into a Sunday service at some point during this lockdown. God is faithful to his promises and nothing can change that. Nothing can stop that, though yet I. And, you know, it might look uh, it might seem this morning that, that life seems so fragile at the moment. You know, we're so vulnerable in so many ways. That's what's been highlighted uh, every day. And yet, even in that, I can rejoice in the Lord because I know the promises of God. That's my foundation. And Jesus says, doesn't he? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. That's my foundation, though X, yet I. Uh, you know, there's a, an account of a man called John Chrysostom, who was a church leader in the fourth century in a city called Constantinople, which we would know as modern day Istanbul in Turkey. And John, he was leading a church there. He was talking to people about Jesus and he was actually arrested at that time. And he was brought before the Empress Eudoxia. And the Empress Eudoxia had John stand before him, uh, her, (laughs) and she said that John would be banished uh, if he kept on doing what he he was doing. And John, in, in response to that threat from the Empress Eudoxia, he said this. He said, you cannot banish me for this world is my father's house. And then the Empress said to John, she said, well, then I'll kill you. And then John replied, he said, no, you cannot. My life is hid with Christ in God. And then the empress said to John, she said, well, I'll take away all your treasures. And John went, no, you cannot. For my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. And then the empress said to John, but I will drive you away from your friends and you will have no one left. And John said, no, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. John said, I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. Do you know, this is the kind of foundation that we have, a foundation that whatever it is that we're faced with, that whatever we're going through, we can say, yet I will rejoice because it because it might look like it's going one way. Everything might look like it's pointing one way, but actually God provides us this morning with a foundation that can never crumble. 
a foundation that is never going to fa fail. And Habakkuk says that at the end, he says, he makes my feet as sure-footed as the deer. It's a picture there of, of the foundation that God gives us. It can never crumble. And so this morning, you know, I was thinking, isn't this what we're desperately looking for in life? Especially during these times that we're living in. To have a foundation like this that is so secure that in actual fact can be called truly unsinkable. And do you know this morning, if we want to know this foundation, if we want to have this foundation, well, then we have to know Jesus. He's ultimately the one who offers and gives us this hope, this foundation that whatever our though is, we are able to say, yet I will rejoice, yet I will rejoice in God, my saviour. Whoever we are this morning, uh, whether church is something that we're familiar with or, or something maybe we're new to. Uh, do you know, Jesus offers us each this morning this unshakable, this unsinkable hope for us to hold on to. A hope that is based in knowing him. A hope that's based in his death and his resurrection. And, you know, this Jesus, he invites us to know him. He invites us to trust him. He invites us to enjoy him ultimately forever, ultimately forever. You know, Romans chapter eight, verse 31 says these words, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And that's what Jesus offers us, a glory that cannot compare with anything here in this world. And so this morning, do you know, we might be finding that our present circumstances are maybe exposing the things that we've put our trust in. We're finding out that they're not the, the firm foundations we once thought they were. They're not unsinkable. And yet, do you know, Habakkuk this morning, it says to us, Find the unshakable, the unsinkable hope that is found ultimately in knowing Jesus, that's found in building our lives on the promises of God, on the words of God, that whilst everything looks like it's pointing one way, actually it doesn't mean that God isn't working. It doesn't mean that God isn't there and it doesn't mean that God isn't going to bring about his promises, but rather God is faithful and we wait in faith. And faith is being confident, fully persuaded, building our lives on the certain and the unshakable foundation of God's promises to us. And therefore, though the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, though there are no cattle in the stalls, this morning, because we know Jesus, we can say, yet I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be joyful in God, my saviour.
every tear I've cried You hold in your hand You've never left my side Though my heart is torn I will praise you in the storm I remember when I stumbled in the wind You heard my cry to you You raised me up again But my strength is almost gone How can I carry on If I can't find you Then as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through the rain I am with you And as your mercy falls I raise my hand And praise the God who gives Takes away And I praise you in this storm And I will lift my hands For you are who we are No matter where I am for every tear I've cried You hold in your hands You never left my side Though my heart is torn I will praise you in the storm I lift my eyes onto the hills Where does my strength come from? My strength comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes onto the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We've enjoyed our time together this morning and I want to thank Dan for bringing um, those words of wisdom to us from that book of Habakkuk and I guess the message I take from it is that the promises of God are the foundation that we can build our hopes and aspirations upon and that phrase um, though X yet I Maybe we can all think about that this week and insert our own words where the X is and after the I and lay that before God and ask him um, to help us. He is the foundation. His promises are never broken. And in these turbulent times, we can trust him and put our faith in him. So, uh, do visit our website, chowdean.church. You can follow us on all the usual social media platforms. And, and we hope that you'll join us again um, through the week at some of the meetings that are going on. Um, but again, next Sunday morning, when we'd love to welcome you back to share with us. And one day, we will be back meeting in person. And everyone here now, everyone who's joined us through the weeks on our virtual online services, We'd love to see you in person when we're able to do that. So, Lord, hasten that day. Shorten these days of difficulty and bring us all back together that we may joyfully stand and worship and praise you once again. So thank you all. Have a great week. Remember, trust God. He is the foundation.